And welcome back to the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton on TV on the Exxon Broadcast Network, iTunes, iHeart, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, Simul Radio, and Simul TV. If you would like to send an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And to find out about the programming on the Exxon Broadcast Network that we have 24-7-365, visit xzbn.net. And for the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV, visit simultv.com. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour is Kenny Fetter. He is a professor of archaeology at Central Connecticut State University and the author of several books on archaeology and criticism of pseudo-archaeology, such as Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries, Science and the Pseudoscience in Archaeology. His book, Encyclopedia of Dubious Archaeology, From Atlantis to Wayland Olam, was published in 2010. His newest book, Ancient America, 50 Archaeological Sites to See for Yourself, was published in 2017. He is the founder and director of the Farmington River Archaeological Project. And Kenny, welcome to the Exxon. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for inviting. It's a great pleasure. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, oh, great. You know, so I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing the next hour with you and the Exxon Nation. First of all, how did you get involved in archaeology, and what was your draw to this more than fascinating uh, topic? You know, I, I have to admit that I was initially drawn to archaeology when I was just a little kid. Mm -hmm. I was four or five years old. And I decided at that point I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. Right. Rob, I wanted to be a dinosaur. You I wanted to be. grow up and be a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And then when I found out, well, no, you really can't become a member of an extinct animal species, mm -hmm. I was pretty heartbroken. But my parents were really good at, at fostering my interest in lots of things. Right. And so they, they when I was even when I was a little kid, they bought me books about dinosaurs, but also books about ancient Egypt and Native Americans. Wow. And that became kind of filtered through my little kid brain mm -hmm. that this I really like thinking about and reading about uh, the past that that's it's like an interesting place to visit and that's really when I when I began with this interest in dinosaurs and then ancient Egypt and Stonehenge and you know I never actually wavered from that um, I just have always been fascinated by the whole notion that here we are in the present and we can in some sense visit the past and, and learn about how past peoples lived. And it's been my, my career um, since the very beginning. How did you get into the field of archaeological frauds? Now, again, you know, I always like to give a shout out to my folks for mm -hmm. being really supportive of my interests. And I appreciate when, that. Yeah, yeah for real. Yeah. When I was a little kid, my, my parents, we didn't have a lot of money. My, my dad was a school teacher. And, but they would, every summer, they would pack me and my sister mm -hmm. into the car and we would drive. We would take trips up to Canada, for example, to Quebec, um, to Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts. And one of the places they took me was a, an outdoor museum in New York, a place called the Farmer's Museum, which is in Cooperstown, where the Baseball Hall of Fame is located. Right. Now, yeah, I wanted to go to Baseball Hall of Fame, but I also was interested in this, this outdoor village where the, the, the buildings were all genuinely old buildings, 1800s, mm -hmm. that were brought there to create this, this imaginary 19th century farming community. In at one, and I remember this really clearly being a little kid, maybe I'm nine or ten years old, and seeing attached to one of the barns and one of the farms, there was this little lean to, and under the lean to was this 11 foot tall giant man of stone. I, you know, and it, it, like, was he petrified? Was he a sculpture? And that, in fact, was the Cardiff giant. So, my first exposure to any of this stuff, to archaeological frauds was seeing the Cardiff Giant and reading a little bit about it there, about how this was this amazing fake perpetrated in the 1869 by a farmer and his cousin who was a cigar manufacturer, and how for several months it was absolutely the most important archaeological discovery of the century. And people from all over the north, northeast United States, from Philadelphia and Boston and New York and even Washington, D.C., came up to New York on the train to see this amazing um, – perhaps he was a man petrified from before Noah's flood. Who knew? 
Um, it was only several months later that the perpetrators of the whole thing admitted, well, you know, they had had a sculpture made in Iowa. They had moved the sculpture to New York. They had buried it for a year. And then on given the high sign, the farmer had hired a couple of guys to dig a well on his property. And the, far, the, the well diggers found the remnants of this this man turned to stone and within a very short period of time they had erected a circus tent and they were charging people 25 cents a look and again thousands of people congregated on this little sleepy farm to see the Cardiff Giant it got so popular I mean the story is just bizarre it got so popular that the famous circus impresario P.T. Barnum actually offered the farmer whose name was Stub Newell thirty thousand dollars for, to purchase the giant, thirty thousand bucks in 1869 translate to that into modern dollar. It's probably three quarters of a million bucks. And the farmer turned P.T. Barnum down and continued exhibiting the giant. They moved him to Syracuse, which was the nearest the nearest town. Mm-hmm. So it's just and scientists. People like O.C. Marsh, who is affiliated with with the Yale Peabody Museum and is one of the most famous paleontologists of the 19th century, he went and saw this thing, this the Cardiff Giant, and he said, well, this is a humbug. This is made out of stone. This is a sculpture. But it didn't make any difference. People wanted to believe. P.T. Barnum's uh, solution, by the way, to the fact that the, the challenge posed by Stub Newell's refusal to sell him the giant, P.T. Barnum went ahead and had a fake giant made now I mean, follow that right uh, a fake Robin, of a fake a, it's a fake of a fake yeah. right you know i know a double negative makes a positive <laughs> i don't think a fake of a fake makes it makes it real no um and the, uh, it's pretty hilarious uh, after a while they actually took the real cardiff giant the real fake on the road mm-hmm. and by sheer coincidence he was in manhattan at the same time the circus was in town and pt barnum's fake cardiff giant outdrew the real Cardiff Giant. He sold more tickets because he was a better he was a better uh, mer- uh, marketer of it. Uh, the famous author um, uh, Mark Twain thought this was so hilarious. He actually wrote a short story called the Ghost Story. And you know, uh, listeners, go and find that online. It's short and it's very very funny about a gentleman who finds himself in this old seedy hotel in Manhattan. Unbeknownst to him, the Cardiff Giant. Was, is being displayed next door, and the ghost of the Cardiff Giant comes into his hotel room begging that somebody please, I, I am doomed to haunt the halls of this hotel mm-hmm. until somebody reburies my body across the street. <laughs> and the joke was on the Cardiff uh-huh. Giant. He was haunting the wrong one. Instead of haunting his actual remains, he was haunting P.T. Barnum's fake. Well, you know, when you're a kid and you read this bizarre story and hear about this bizarre story and actually see the re- the remains of the real Cardiff Giant, it just stuck in my head forever. And then when I began teaching archaeology, it just that seemed like a really good story to bring up to students. And they responded so positively. And then they began asking me about what about other stories? What about Piltown Man? What about Atlantis? What about the Mound Builders? And after a very short period of time, it became a course. And then... You know, when I teach a course and there aren't any good books available, I say, well, what what the heck? I might as well write my own book. And that was that was as far back as 1990. Uh, And that book, The Frauds, Myths and Mysteries, the book we're talking about, is still in print. And in fact, it will be going into its 10th edition sometime next year. So clearly I touched a chord. People like to hear these stories, whether they agree with my diagnosis or not. That's Mm -hmm. not really important. But they're they're interested in how these stories inform us about people's understanding of human antiquity the the stories about human antiquity they have certainly bled into present day society with uh, urban legends for example uh, uh the mothman and then bigfoot uh and, and the list goes on and on and on is this part of society do we need urban legends do we need mythology in our lives in order to sustain sometimes some people might call it sanity i call it insanity <laughs> Well, it could be one or the other. Yeah. You know, that's a really hard question to answer. Here's here's the way I'll answer it. Um, I don't know if it's abs- – maybe the answer is yes. Every society has these stories or myths mm-hmm. or legends that, and that most people say, well, we're not quite sure if it's true, but they're interesting things. Right. right? They're cool things to talk around a, a fire when you're out camping. They're cool stories to tell when you've lost power and there are nothing but candles in your house. And they're, they're cool. They, they certainly generate a reaction about the, the Mothman or – 
um, extraterrestrial aliens kidnapping people. And it's like, well, are, is the evidence there or not? They're interesting things to talk about. My attitude about these stories is, hey, look, I'm a scientist. I, I am an archaeologist dedicated to studying what I think is the, sci the science of the human past. But if people become interested in knowing about human antiquity on the basis of these stories that maybe I would disagree with, that's okay. Kenny, stand by. We've got to take our break. I'm sorry. These are hard breaks. I can't get out no of them. No problem. Kenny Fetter is our special guest, Exonation. If you'd like to find out more about Kenny, visit his site, uh, ccsu.edu forward slash faculty forward slash Fetter, and that's F-E-D-E-R. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We'll be back after this break. Don't go away. Exonation, uh, Kenny Fetters, our special guest. Uh, his website is ccsu.edu forward slash faculty forward slash F-E-D-E-R. Kenny, uh, I had to stop you. We were talking about, uh, you know, myth, urban legends in today's sure. society. So please continue. Right. So, so the point I was trying to make, and, you know, Rob, I apologize. I tend to prattle on. <laughs> and uh, you know, if we had a four hour show, we wouldn't need any breaks. I would just keep talking. Um, but the point I was making is making is, look, um, there are lots of disagreements about uh, legends and myths sure. and what's where's the truth? Where's the kernel of truth inside of those mm -hmm. those those legends or myths? And my perspective is, look, um, I'm passionate about the, pa the human past, about human antiquity. And if. The th if what brings people to reading my book or emailing me or listening to one of my podcasts, if what brings them to 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 my to me as a source is is a myth or a legend, that's OK. That's really fine. And we can have a disagreement about what the significance of all that stuff is. But basically what I'm going to give you is this is what we know based on the physical, material, archaeological record. This is what we have actually found, mm -hmm. and this is how we interpret it. And if that brings – if if, if the, the myths and legends and the stories and the, the, um, the cable TV shows – if that's what brings them to me, that's I'm fine with that. That's really OK. And then we can have a conversation about how we know what we know in science, uh, whether we're talking about uh, ancient aliens or Bigfoot or pre-Columbian visitors to the New World, because we do – archaeologists deal with that all the time. We have – we have methods that we have built upon for more than a century, mm -hmm. and we, we love talking to people about this stuff. Let me ask you, what, have, what is your all-time favorite archaeological fraud that you have investigated? Yeah, that, that, there actually are several answers for that. Give, I mean, give, one me, the, give me the top two. The top two, Cardiff Giant, which I've already yep. spoken about, and this other one is a, a recent one. It is the Black Dragon pictograph um, that's in Black Dragon Canyon, which is uh, in Utah. Uh, and I think that's one of my favorites because it's just so beautiful. Um, the, the whole area, the San Rafael Swell, is just red and white and, and, and tan rocks intersected by lots and lots of canyons. And Native Americans have been there for thousands and thousands of years, and they have left behind a record of what we in the modern world would consider art mm -hmm. um, that's part of their – probably part of ceremonies, part of religious traditions. And the one I'm, I'm referring to here has four years. It's this beautiful piece of rock art. It's a painting um, that's probably 1,000 or 2,000 years old. And at first glance, it looks like a pterodactyl. But I, I'll, I'll admit that, that if you just look at the outline of it, it looks like a pterodactyl. Pterodactyls have been extinct for tens of millions of years, and yet the artwork is only a couple of thousand years old. How could Native Americans paint the image of a pterodactyl and a canyon wall in Utah? Good question. Uh, oh, abs absolutely, right? Did ter pterodactyls live much more recently than we think? Mm -hmm. Did Native Americans, were they in North America much, more, much um, longer ago than we think? And here's where 
simple things like modern technology allowed us to answer the question, allowed the researchers who actually studied this to answer the question. And it's something as simple as using infrared cameras. It's something as simple as um, using D-Stretch, which is a, a very well-known um, piece of software for enhancing photographic images, especially rock art images. Yeah. When you find out that if you look at the, you know, most rock art over years, it erodes, it weathers, and it's sometimes hard to make out the entirety of the image. When you use modern technology, modern camera techniques, modern software to enhance that image, it turns out that there's not one single animal, a pterodactyl. There are five different images that our mind seems to push together into this strange looking, maybe it's a pterodactyl, mm. maybe it's a bat, maybe it's an eagle. But in fact, it's none of those things. It's, it's a couple of people standing up. It's a big horn sheep. It's a big snake with its, with its mouth open wide. Um, and so it's, that's not so much a fake. What it is is a misinterpretation of a piece of rock art. Um, and so it, and I don't think for me that it doesn't lose any of its allure, any of its magic. We're still looking at human beings 2000 years ago, 1000 to 2000 years ago, put, conveying onto this rock canvas images that were important to them as part of their ceremonies. And maybe we'll never know exactly what it meant to them, mm -hmm. but we know that, you know what, it's not a pterodactyl. That's our mind kind of imposing that pterodactyl image over the rock art. Uh, apparently, according to doctors that we've had on the show, what happens is the, the mind sees an image and then it tries to put all the pieces together on its own with actual, without actually understanding what the image is, but it yeah. figures, okay, you know, this is what it should look like, and bang, 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 and away you go, and the person gets that image in their mind, and from there on, the, the story goes. Um, so how do you, as, as an archaeologist go out and say, listen, guys, this isn't the way it is. Here's the truth. This is how I found it. This is where the evidence lies. You know, the, Rob, that's a really good question, and I'll tell you why. Um, a lot, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to criticize my profession a little bit here. Mm -hmm. A lot of archaeologists want to ignore that stuff. I mean, they do. They, you know, that like the the, the listeners of your broadcast, um, maybe they're drawn to this because of the paranormal content. And a lot of of scientists, too many archaeologists say we're not even going to talk about that stuff. We don't want to. We don't want to deal with that. We're mm -hmm. going to ignore that. And I think that's a huge mistake. Um, I, for me, for my money, I want to engage people. I want to. And you know, when we walk away friendly and. We don't we don't agree. We disagree. That's really OK. That's right. Um, that's part of the process. It doesn't bother me at all. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you, Rob, every once in a while I'll get an email where I even and I, I, I have kind of a potty mouth, but sometimes I blush <laughs> at the words they use in the subject line. I go, well, that's not an invitation to a conversation, actually. Um, but but so but I think, listen, I do this podcast called Archaeological Fantasies with mm -hmm. Jeb Card and Sarah Head. And we talk we confront these things head on. My book, my Archaeological Frauds book, is out there expressly because, hey, look, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There are a lot, of, a lot of opinions. I, I'd like you to know the, here's the opinion of, a, of an archaeologist with 40 years of experience. Mm -hmm. So having the opportunity of having an archaeologist on my show with 40 years of experience. There you go. What is your take on all the different claims of Atlantis? In fact, I'm glad you asked that question because there's an entire chapter about Atlantis in my book. There's a lot in the Frauds book. There's a lot of mis misapprehensions, a lot of misinterpretations, misrepresentations. The deal with Atlantis is, look, the first time that shows up anywhere, the story of Atlantis, is in Plato. And yep. It's about 350 B.C., so about 2,500 years ago. And Plato was not a historian, not an archaeologist. The guy's a philosopher. And he uses the story of this incredibly powerful ancient civilization as a metaphor. When, when people ask me about Atlantis and say, well, well, listen, Kenny, how do you explain the fact that Plato talked about Atlantis, the perfect society? I say, well, you've got to go back and read the story. The, the perfect society in the Atlantean dialogues, the Timaeus and Critias, it isn't Atlantis. It's a, it's a mythical ancient Athens from 
9,000 years before Plato, 11,000 years or more before the present. And in that, in his story, Athens is living the perfect, the perfect, um, they have the perfect society. In fact, when I tell, I tell my students that I use this all the time, if you think about the actual Atlanta story, it's a story about a large, very powerful, economically wealthy, militarily advanced, technologically advanced, super civilization that is about that wants to take over its known universe but they're evil they're, they've gone bad and the only thing standing in their way is a small ragtag group of folks who are living the right way of life in other words i don't know the force is with them the story of atlantis is told by plato is just an early version of star wars atlantis is the evil empire in the story they're the ones who have strayed from their godly ways they become uh, greedy and pernicious and militaristic, and the only thing stopping them from de- from taking over the world, mm-hmm. and in Plato's mind, the world was Europe and Northern Africa. Right. Um, the only thing standing in their way are the, are these folks in Athens who are not militarily powerful, and they're not economically wealthy, and they're not technologically sophisticated, but you know what? They're living a good way of life, and they're able to defeat Atlantis. And, of course, then the gods destroy Atlantis entirely, conveniently, so you know you can never find it. It's under the Atlantic Ocean. Plato did that on purpose. Um, Plato, Plato was well aware of what he did. Philosophers have long studied Plato and said, okay, he made up this story. Maybe it was based on some true stuff. Maybe it was based a little bit on the, the um, uh, volcanic eruption on Thera that had – that damaged the Minoan civilization long before Plato was writing. So maybe there are these true elements as fiction writers do that all the time, but that essentially his job was not to tell a history. It was to teach a lesson about what happens when civilizations become greedy and rich and aggressive and territorial. They ultimately fall because the gods are angry at them. So it's all a bunch of bunk. You know, but it, here's the thing. I don't consider the Atlantis story bunk. It tells of it teaches a valuable lesson. But like, you know, like fiction writers make up stuff all the time to help them get their point across. Right. So uh, an ancient, very powerful civilization uh, 11,000 years ago in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Nope. there's there's no geological evidence for it. There's no archaeological evidence for it. And that, there's no historical evidence for it. So that's what we're going on. All right. Stand by. We've got to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exxon Nation. Kenny Fetters, our special guest this hour. His website is ccsu.edu forward slash faculty forward slash F-E-D-E-R. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And uh, Kenny and I return on the other side of the news to further talk about the strange, the weird, the unknown, and a lot more. Don't go away. Kenny Federer is my guest, Exxon Nation. And uh, uh, Kenny, when we look at what Plato did and how society has taken it, there are, there are books that are written on, on Atlantis. There are people spending money looking for Atlantis. How has, the, how has the Internet sparked and fed and fueled the fraudulent archaeological business? Uh, the bottom line there is that, look, before there was the Internet, um, there are a lot of, of – I guess you would call them gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. When people had an idea about whether it's Atlantis or transatlantic travel between the old and new world or ancient aliens. Before, before the internet, there at least it, for publications, for most journals, for most publishers of books, there, there's this gatekeeper, right? And so they're going to – you send them a manuscript and they're going to send it out to folks and say, does this make any sense? That's what happens for my – if I write a book. It does, the publisher doesn't just say, "Oh, Kenny Fader, we're going to publish his book." Mm-hmm. They send it out for review. There, so there are there are ways of filtering out stuff that maybe isn't isn't properly done, doesn't make any sense. That there are strong arguments against it. 
And the internet is great for allowing everybody a say, but there's a drawback to that. And what that drawback is, there really aren't any gatekeepers. So anybody can have a website. Anybody can say whatever they want on the internet. And that's okay. But it also means that folks have to be careful about what they read and what they take away from what they read. And the bottom line for all of that stuff, look, if you read something on the internet, if it's something I've written or something that any one of a host of other people have written, the, the question to ask is, all right, does this follow logic? Does this make sense in um, a scientific sense? If that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for evidence and proof, is the evidence sufficient? Is the proof sufficient? Are other sources con um, uh, cited? Are uh, alternate opinions or alternate hypotheses considered? Um, and that's not just for a fringe website that's for any website and you know everybody in that and you're all you're kind of on your own of trying to figure that out you know what i what i tell folks always is look um merely because i have a phd in arc in anthropology and an archaeologist and i've been doing this for literally four decades that doesn't mean i'm always going to be right and it doesn't mean that somebody who's not done any research who hasn't really done the work is always going to be wrong but on, from a statistical perspective, when you go online on the internet, if you see stuff, claims made, for example, on a, an accredited museum site or a university site or somebody who has a lot of experience, statistically, they, the odds are better that that is going to be correct, that that will be the most reasonable explanation mm -hmm. for a particular mystery. Um, and that somebody who doesn't have the background, who who's, hasn't done the research, no field work, hasn't, doesn't, didn't go through the process of training, they're not always going to be wrong, Rob. I, I admit that. But the odds of them being right and showing all of the scientists with all the, the work done are going to be wrong. It's, uh, it, the odds are lower. That's not zero. Mm. Let's make that real clear. But that's kind of that's one of the, the issues about the Internet is that it's sometimes really difficult to know. All right. This is a really interesting interpretation of this piece of rock art or this is a really interesting interpretation of this archaeological site. But how do I know if it's legit? And again, it's it's kind of it's common sense is what you have to apply. You see, I call the Internet the largest septic tank that God and <laughs> mankind has ever created because there's more crap in it than anything else. But there's so much good stuff as well. You know, you take the good with the bad. Um, as a, an, a professor I know used to say, mm -hmm. you know, you got to keep an open mind. Like it's an open is like an open mind. But you know, when you keep a really open mind, you're going to get a lot of garbage thrown into it. Sure will. But you got to be able to fill. You have to in, internally. You have to have some internal system of filtering out the stuff that doesn't make any sense from the stuff that does. And for me, what makes sense is we've got. Um, authentic archaeological artifacts and stratigraphic context with legitimate, good, solid dates with, with again, with stratigraphic um, profiles and proveniences taking and a whole bunch of other stuff that, that confirms in my mind, okay, that looks legit, even if the results are something that surprised me. And I love being surprised. You talked briefly about ancient uh, aliens or ancient astronauts. Yeah. Are, are they real? You know, I, I've I've met Eric von Donneken, and I and I've I've hosted sure. uh, a lecture and seminar in St. Catharines going back to the nineteen. Mm -hmm. I think it was nineteen ninety seven or nineteen ninety eight. Eric von Donneken came over, and you know his 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 friend at the at the time was Giorgio Tsoukalakis, who now does the Ancient Aliens TV right. show. Uh huh. And and I watch that, and I say, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Like, well, you know, yeah. And and Look, yet there are so many people who believe it. Well, wouldn't it be cool? I mean, I, you know, sometimes the, my party line is always real archaeology is way more interesting. The stuff that we really know is far more interesting than what I consider the nonsense yeah. that's that's spewed by these folks. But the reality is, you know, if you. Rob, if you were to call me at 3 o'clock in the morning, wake me up from a sleep, and I'm in a stupor, and you go, come on, Fader, wouldn't it be really cool if ancient astronauts had landed on Earth and there's evidence for it? i got to admit something to you, Rob. This is just you and me talking, right? Yeah, yeah that would yeah. be pretty cool. That certainly would be pretty cool. But he, the bottom line here is, yeah. what does the evidence show? 
And the evidence, you know, Von Donneken, the, the first book, Chariots of the Gods, written by Eric Von Donneken, put him on the map, very, very popular. I see there being three primary claims made in that book. And the first is really strange, which is that ancient aliens landed on Earth and actually mated with our ancestors to create the next version of human beings in an evolutionary sequence. Um, and when, you know, people said, well, maybe he didn't mean they made it, but maybe he meant artificial stuff. Um, in an interview that Von Donegan did with Playboy back in the 70s, he said, they made it. he used the word sex. Yep. He said aliens would have sex with, uh, and the, the funny thing is, go to any museum and look at a reconstruction of Australopithecus or Homo habilis, and it's like, they're basically upright apes. So, you know, I, I, I don't think when Neil Armstrong, the American astronaut who first set, stepped on the moon, I just don't see Neil, you know, getting busy with Australopithecus <laughs> two million years ago to create the next step in human evolution. But m and, maybe, just maybe, that's where the term monkeying around comes from. Oh, my God, Rob. I, now I want, if Sorry. people are going to write letters, they have to write those to you. <laughs> that was not me sp speaking, all right? Okay. You know? But... But th there's the deal. I mean, in terms of it, for two species who both evolved on one planet, Earth, to be able to have the matching physical equipment to mate and no then sense. to produce offspring who are fertile mm -hmm. is like that's unheard of. There are, there are very few to well, have a species a on an, another planet yeah. come here and even have the matching equipment to have to, to to engage in sexual reproduction. So that that's just an absurdity. But wait a sec, wait a sec. In the Bible, it also says the Nephilim came down and mated with the fair maidens of Earth. Yeah, well, maybe the Nephilim were, were maybe the Cardiff Giant was actually a Nephilim turned to stone. I, I, I mean, think personally, know. I think personally that Von Donneken took a lot of what he talked about from the Bible and put his own spin on it because he all he was basically was an innkeeper. And I'm still trying right. to under, yeah. understand after all these years, where the hell he got his credibility from? Uh, you know, I think it, what's really what's really good for Eric von Donneken is, is that that book, Chariots of the Gods, must have been published. It was the right time. Mm -hmm. It was people were searching for something, something to to maybe explain where we fit into the greater cosmos. And you know what? Uh, 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 I understand that, you know, thinking that we are the product, we are star children. We are the product of mating between very advanced super civilization. And maybe we are this nursery and they're watching over us and they're not going to let us die in a nuclear holocaust. They're not going to let us destroy the planet's environment because there, there, uh, there, there is a, there's an argument that for a lot of people, ultimately the ancient aliens are like God. They have exactly. godlike powers mm -hmm. And, and, you know, Von Donneken is really upfront about that. And so is Sucolos about, you know, in, in all the in all the religious texts of all the cultures, when they talk about the gods coming down from the sky, really what they're talking about are, are ancient aliens who have these powers that are so amazing that to primitive people, they seem godlike. They're magical. And I, I think it was I think it was Arthur C. Clarke, the the um, science fiction author, who said that. For for any group of people coming into contact with an advanced civilization, the abilities of that ancient civilization would appear to be magic. And I, I get that. So, so there's the argument from both sides that either, oh, well, the ancient, the ancient gods of, of every civilization are actually aliens, or maybe that's why people embrace this, that there is this power outside of us. And it's not necessarily the God of the Bible, but the, these creatures have mm -hmm. these godlike powers and ultimately are looking over, looking out for our best interests because we are, after all, partially them. We are related to them. We are their children. We are their creation. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I guess. I guess. We are their missing link because the, another metaphor would be is that if if the ancient aliens did have sex with monkeys or, or earlier, you know, you know monkeying around and so on that would also explain a family tree i guess we've got to i know I'll, I'll take the blame on that one as well kenny there you go we've got to take our final break kenny fetter is our special guest this hour exo nation www.ccsu.edu forward slash faculty forward slash better and uh he's the author of frauds myths and mysteries and uh, we're going to talk to kenny about how we can get copies of his books and what he's doing in the future and uh 
what? I've got a question or two to still ask him, and uh, we'll both be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And to watch us on Simul TV, the X Zone TV channel is Channel 21. Kenny Fetter is our guest. Uh, his website is ccsu.edu forward slash faculty forward slash F-E-D-E-R. First of all, Kenny, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a great oh, pleasure talking to you. Oh, this was a pleasure. This is so easy to do. And I love talking about this stuff, as you can tell. I can, so it was just, it was my pleasure. I can tell, and I certainly do appreciate the work that you've done over the years and uh, congratulate you on all the books that you've written. And we look uh, forward Thanks. to you know, having you on the show again in the future to help us discern fact from fiction. But speaking about that, he says, with an ulterior motive in mind, sure. all the all the archaeological sites around the world that we believe are, are taught to be true, and not only that, but let's take a look at history. Kids in school today are still being taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America. Oh, we know he didn't. We know that he was one of the people that came over here. Mm-hmm. I often wonder how different history would be if the truth was taught compared to what academia wants us to know. Well, you know, you, you know there's, there are some subtle lines there. But let me answer that this mm-hmm. way. Um, look, the deal here is that scientists are all about um, knowledge and evidence, and that wherever the knowledge and evidence takes us, that's the direction we ultimately go in. And, you know, scientists are people. They have preconceptions. They have biases. Um, the, the thing is, when you, when you, you, know, you brought up Columbus, when right. I teach my classes, I ask kids the same question. You know, I ask them, what's the oldest, longest, conti- the, the oldest continuously occupied settlement in North America? And students in the Northeast will say, oh, Plymouth. Or they'll know that Jamestown is older. Or maybe they'll know that St. Augustine in Florida, Spanish settlement, is older. And I tell them, whichever one of those answers they give me, I say, no, wrong. There are today Native American communities that have been continuously occupied for more than a thousand years. And we ignore that. We forget that. And that's a that's an issue. When I teach about the mound builders in the American Midwest, mm-hmm. you're right, Rob. That's something that we want to get that word out. But kids don't hear about it in elementary school they don't hear about it in high school and when i ask kids in my classes have you heard about the mississippians have you heard about the city of cahokia uh a a, a city of thirty thousand people along the banks of the mississippi river that dates to maybe 1200 a.d and 1300 a.d have you heard about that that the first native american city north of mexico and most students say we never heard of that and that's a real problem and getting the word out and that's not, that's not academics trying to hide the truth. That's academics like me bemoaning the fact that not enough time is spent in high school history classes and social studies classes to get those stories out about what historians and archaeologists actually know about the past, about antiquity. And that's, that's a real struggle. It's a constant struggle, and it's kind of a never-ending struggle. But you know what? We're fighting the good fight, and students of mine then go on to – careers in archaeology or in in in, in um, uh, social studies they go out and teach in high schools and they're they that they're the generation that is i think going to begin to flip the story so that what we really know about the past is shared with students um in, uh, in secondary schools and they won't be ignorant about what archaeology and history actually does tell us about the human past in your opinion what is the most significant archaeological find of the 20th century. Wow. That's, I mean, 
that's so difficult. There are, there are like – I have uh, 20 different answers. You know, Rob, that's like asking me, so, Kenny, you have three kids. Which one do you like the best? Which one's your favorite kid? Now, uh, since none of them are going to listen to this probably, I probably – I could tell you, but I'm not going <laughs> to. But, so, but, so the most significant of the 20th century yeah. – um, uh, let's one of them. There's a whole bunch of. Them. All right, I'll give one, you, just name a few off. All right, Lonzo Meadow. Lonzo Meadow is a Canadian site in Newfoundland mm-hmm. that finally, categorically, definitively shows that the Norse were living in North America at least 500 years before Columbus. Now, there's other evidence of the Norse presence in North America. I'll grant you that, but until what? early 1960s and the Ingstads, the, the, the team led by um, Einstein Ingstad and Helge Ingstad found Lonzo Meadow and excavated that. And they found bronze artifacts. They've got radiocarbon dates. That was a game changer for archaeologists because we no longer were talking about, well, we think the, the Norse were here and we read the sagas and that seems to indicate, mm-hmm. uh-uh, we've got, this is what archaeology lives for. Direct, physical, definitive evidence that what we thought before is either false or, wow, what we thought before but we weren't sure about, absolutely true. So that's that's a super important uh, discovery in the 20th century. The discovery in Egypt along the Nile of Hierakonpolis, which was a, a place where a pottery baron lived. This is before the pharaohs, but it shows how that site grew – Power was concentrated in the hands of these people making pottery, and eventually that led to the earliest pharaoh. And so that was super important because the pharaohs don't just show up in antiquity. There's got to be a background. There's got to be context. And sure enough, that discovery was made, and now we know it's, again, a game changer. Now we know what the context was for the development, the evolution of the Egyptian state, the Egyptian civilization. And I think that virtually every world area has evidence like that. If we look at Africa, the discovery just within the last year of fossil remains that of crania that look just like yours and mine, Rob, um, and that are 300,000 years old. When I began teaching in the late 1970s, My party line was that the oldest evidence of anatomically modern Homo sapiens, people looking just like us, maybe that's 40 or 50,000 years old. Now, it's 40 years later, and when I go into that same class, I say, you know what? We now have very clear evidence in Africa that the first people who look just like us at least 200,000 years ago, maybe 300,000 years old. That's remarkable. It also belies the conceit that, well, archaeologists are closed-minded and they never accept any new data. I'm here to tell you we do that all of the time. But again, the bottom line here, the gold standard is, is there good physical archaeological evidence to support these game-changing claims? And when it's there – Rob, I, I don't think we do it grudgingly. I think we applaud those changes. And when, when, a new, when a new discovery is made tomorrow or next week and I have to go back and change my frauds book, I'm happy to do it. Wow. One, one more quick uh, question. Uh, is there any archaeological evidence that there was a global flood as talked about in the, uh, in the Bible? Um, my, my answer to that is no. But I, but but there's an explanation. Okay. Um, it looks like if you lived in the area between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, those mm-hmm. are the rivers in Mesopotamia, and those things flood uh, unpredictably. The Nile floods regularly; you can set a clock to it. But the Tigris and Euphrates, it depends on how much snow there is in the snowpack up north. Um, they flood unpredictably, and as far back as the 1950s, archaeologists working in that area discovered a flood deposit. That was 11 feet thick. Now, honestly, I live by the side of a river, and if we get a quarter of an inch of deposit in the spring when the river floods, it's a lot. 11 foot thick deposit of alluvium, of silt from a flood, it, along the Tigris and Euphrates, that – if you lived in that area, Rob, you probably thought the entire world is underwater. That flood didn't reach north. And that's, we're not talking about Europe or Africa mm-hmm. or North America, South America. It wasn't worldwide in the literal sense. 
But for the people living in that area, for their world, it was. It may have seemed that way. And you know what? That may be the source of the flood story, which is older than the Bible. It's it's in um, legends of Mesopotamia that predate the Bible. And there's a version of Noah in the Utnapishtim, who was a, a Mesopotamian who was told by God to build a boat and to cover it with pitch. So that story is longstanding in that part of the world. And it may reflect, it may reflect an, an historical event that get, then gets included in these religious texts. One more one, uh, one last one I should say because we're running out of time very fast. Stonehenge. Stonehenge is one of my favorite places in the world. And it's also a place where we learn new stuff all the time. Um, Stonehenge was in all likelihood a 4,600 year old version of a calendar for keeping track of the position of the sun on the horizon. Um, there's no, I, I don't think there's any doubt about that, that the heel stone at Stonehenge is meant to demarcate the summer solstice. And you can look at the, the march of that sun across the horizon mm-hmm. during the course of a year. And at Stonehenge, they built this giant, this giant, timepiece to keep track of that and now we know that people from all over Europe were buried at Stonehenge based on the strontium content of their bones we know that the stones some of the stones the blue stones in the center of Stonehenge came from more than 100 miles away in Wales and we kind of know how they brought it there we know that a couple miles away from Stonehenge is this large village where feasts were 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 um, regularly um, happened feasts and it probably were the people who built Stonehenge, the people who who worshipped there would gather at that site and they would kill a bunch of animals and they would have this gigantic feast to commemorate maybe the, the rising of the sun on the summer solstice. So it's a, it's a great, fascinating place. It, it shows the great intellect, intelligence, the genius of ancient people who, by the way, didn't need ancient aliens to teach them how to do any of that <laughs> stuff. Listen, Kenny, we've run out of time for tonight. Quickly tell our listeners where they can get your fabulous books. All right, you can get my fabulous books at Amazon, um, amazon Amazon.com, my frauds book, my dubious archaeology, some of my textbooks. And right this minute, I am kind of combining my frauds book with my Ancient America book, which is Visiting Sites, a new book called Archaeological Oddities, in which some of the places we talked about today, that you can visit these places and see for yourself the the strange, weird, and odd archaeological sites in uh, in North America, anyway. Kenny, thanks very much for joining us, and uh, we'll have you back in the future because we still have so much to talk about. Until then, take care of yourself, my friend. A real pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting you me. You take care, sir. And once again, Exxon Nation, you can visit Kenny online at ccsu.edu forward slash faculty forward slash F-E-D-E-R. I'll be back on the other side of this break. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Don't go away.